I'm going to begin by telling you a short story about somebody I love very much who changed her life by educating herself. My mother was born illegitimate in war-torn Greece and was soon after orphaned. As a young teenager during the German occupation of Athens, she was forbidden from going to school. Yet she was so determined to change her life and learn that she found ways to get educational materials from her local community. She studied alone by candle night at night, while martial law forbade the use of electricity, and while Greeks were being hung outside of her apartment window. Yet she persevered, and as a result, she was one of 16 young women to be able to leave Athens with a full scholarship to the London School of Nursing in 1945. So there you have my inspiration and my passion. Human connection through community and access to educational materials and to information are the critical keys that empower people to change their lives and improve them. Over the last three years, I've been working on something called the Agora Projects. If you were to go to Greece today, you would learn that an agora today means a marketplace. But in ancient Greece, it was so much more than that. It was this beautiful open space defined by trees and buildings where people would gather together from all walks of life to share their ideas, tell them stories about where they come from, information and news. It was also a community gathering place where people would go for education, for talks on politics, philosophy, history. It's where the arts flourished. The most famous agora was the one in Athens. It was called the Agora in Greek. And it was famous because not only was it the civic center of life, it was the beginning of democracy. And it was a place where some of the most brilliant and inspirational minds in history shared their ideas. It's where Socrates delivered his great discourses and where he asked his eternal question that I'm about to pose to you to think about. What is your understanding of the meaning of life? It's also where Plato taught his student, Aristotle, who then taught Alexander the Great. So you can imagine, it was a pretty amazing place to be. So let's fast forward to today. Times have changed, I get that. But what hasn't changed is our need for human connection, our need for access to information and to education. So how have these needs changed today? What's different about them? Because clearly we've changed. Have any of you ever felt alone or disconnected before? Maybe you work for long hours behind a computer screen. And even though there may be hundreds of other people in your office building, maybe you haven't felt like there really has been a connection. Or maybe you work from home, and that false sense of connection that you have all day long from your virtual community falls away or disappears at the end of the day when you get up from your computer, because it's not really there. Or maybe you're one of the more unfortunate ones who's been discriminated against for any number of unjust reasons, and you feel alienated or you feel different. Well, whatever the reason or the cause doesn't matter. It's that it's a very painful place for one person, for one family, or for one society to be in. So how is it possible, then tell me, when there are more ways to communicate than ever before, how is it possible that people are feeling more isolated than ever? It's become such a huge problem worldwide with devastating consequences that everyone in here knows about. We all know about. It's being called by psychologists. Isolation today is being called the modern plague. Yet it's ironic, isn't it? Because we live in a world of constant mobile communication. Matter of fact, 63% of all mobile phone owners worldwide report sleeping with their phones. Talk about constant mobile communication. So let's face it, we live in a digital world. It's the way we work, it's the way we learn, it's the way we share information, 
I guess for some people it's the way they sleep. But I can't imagine that there's a single person who could tell me that their life hasn't changed in one way or another as a, a result of technology in the last 10 to 20 years, but at least in the developed world. And more than likely, their stress level has increased as well. Clearly, when technology accelerates, so do the demands on our human performance. And that's stressful, especially at the rate at which technology is accelerating. But so also do the demands for uh, reliable electricity. And that stresses not only our power systems, but our environment. Even a minor power outage today of one electrical cycle, which is equivalent to 1 60th of a second, 1 60th of a second is sufficient to crash servers, computers, life support systems, you name it. So there's the answer to my, my question about what's different today about these needs, is that we all rely on technology and on electricity to run it for almost everything that we do. So have you ever thought what it might be like not to have any electricity? Because according to the United Nations Foundation, one and a half billion people still have no access. And another one billion have intermittent access. Which one's worse? Not having any? Or trying to rely on something completely unreliable? So while technology may be changing our lives faster than we would like it to, it has been absolutely miraculous in so many other ways. And one of them happens to be the World Wide Web, which has opened up a whole new world of educational opportunities. And I can't help but think back to my mom. If she were a young girl today, would she have access to that information? Because clearly, that's how she would be educating herself today if she needed to. Or would she still be one of these children, the 61 million primary school age children who are being denied their right to an education. That I won't know. But what I do know is that there's this whole new world of information and opportunity just waiting for them, if only they had access. So clearly, we need more human connection and more human interaction. We need more reliable sources of electricity and renewable energy. We need more access to information and to educational materials. So why don't we look back to history for some of the ideas that brought these things together that made them, that worked? What might the world be like today if ancient agoras were still central parts of our lives? And what might a 21st century agora look like because our needs have changed. Well, the Agora Projects is a new architectural startup, and we focus entirely on solutions to environmental and social problems. We design and build solar-powered, Wi-Fi-enabled community gathering pavilions that connect, educate, empower, and restore. And I'd like to show you a short video of one of our designs and how it works. Agora Hotspots is working to bring self-directed education, economic access, and community development to disadvantaged neighborhoods worldwide by constructing solar-powered, Wi-Fi-enabled pavilions in small park-like settings. It is the 21st century neighborhood branch library for the developing world. The Agora hotspot can be constructed on any open flat lot. We excavate a sunken seating area and construct the masonry seating ring and support pylons. The basic kit of frame and solar canopy arrives in a secure shipping container and is erected by a local construction crew under our supervision. Then the host organization installs the landscaping. We install and activate the Wi-Fi, tablets, lights and controls. Both the physical and system operations are extremely simple, abuse-resistant and durable. The most powerful grassroots cure for poverty, intolerance, radicalism and tyranny 
is access to education and economic opportunity. Traditional educational models are typically expensive. The Agora is the most cost-effective way to create educational and economic opportunity for the most people. Self-directed learning is sweeping the world because it works. With no staff required, no rent, no books, no utility fees, and only the most minimal upkeep required, this school without walls costs only a tiny fraction of the cost of a traditional enclosed and thermally conditioned building. The Agora gathers people into a functional and organically social neighborhood node where they can use technology to connect to instead of disconnect from each other. Community will also be what makes this project successful and enduring. In order to receive an Agora, a community must apply for and commit to taking responsibility itself for maintaining the Agora. The fiscal donor's commitment will include replacing the three tablets once a month. The old tablets will be donated to local public schools, ensuring that the ripple effect of the Agora cascades widely throughout the community. An Agora embodies true sustainable design. It utilizes and demonstrates the practical, real-world application of renewable energy and utilizes local artisans and materials for over 95% of the construction. The ongoing operations have zero carbon impact. We are in the final stages before launch and are seeking funding and partners to begin installing these pavilions worldwide. Contact us today to discuss becoming a fiscal donor sponsor or a recipient community. So as you can see, the applications are as vast and as varied as the people are different who are going to use the Agora. Because as an off-grid solar charging station, the Agora is not only self-sustaining, but it generates enough energy to power all 40 outlets that are embedded within its seating ring. And even when all of those 40 outlets are in use at the same time, charging a mix of laptops, cell phones, tablets, the surplus energy is sufficient to run a number of other electrical appliances. So if you can imagine 40 people all plugged in for, let's say, a meeting or a reunion or a class outside, the surplus energy is still sufficient to run a water filtration system or refrigeration for critical medical supplies in remote areas, an audiovisual system for use as an outdoor classroom or as a performance venue, in schools, at universities, on corporate campuses, let's say security lights for inner city safety, or um, irrigation pumps for urban farms. You know, what I've learned throughout my life is that there's a solution to every problem. But in order for that solution to be effective, it needs to be resilient. And the Agora is designed to be just that. It is resilient may not look like it, but it's resilient. <laughs> um, the computer tablets are securely and safely embedded within a concrete pylon. And the thin film solar panels are cabled within a marine grade vinyl. The canopy itself has been tested by the US military in some of the most extreme environments. So it's rugged. And it has a patent on it. So we're ready to go. And I can't wait, because what I love to do most is see how people interact with my work. I want to meet with them in the Agora and learn about their lives, hear their stories, and find out how I can improve the design to better serve their community. My hope is that the Agora is one such place, away from home and away from work, where people will gather together safely and share their ideas and their stories share the information and the electricity. Whether it's in a community park, or in a corporate setting, or in an underserved community, that will help bridge the divide between neighborhoods, between people, and help bridge the divide between our digital and our social lives. That it'll be a good example of how easy and productive off-grid solar solutions really are that will invite those curious minds to come and learn. Use the information, use the electricity, and take it home and improve their lives. That by offering unlimited access to the World Wide Web, to online courses, 
to the democratization of learning movement that agoras will be used to help equalize education. And finally, my hope is that it will invite people to connect. Connect to their environment, connect to electricity, connect to each other, and connect to the world. Thank you very much.